Before we get started, I want to start each night sharing with you some quotes, all right? Some quotes on prayer from some theologians from present and theologians past, some guys that just preachers and, and authors that have come before us uh, that have shared their wisdom, and I think it'd be good for us to share. So some of these names you may recognize, some of you may not. Not really that important. Just know that these are trusted people that have been faithful servants of the Lord. And some of them are with the Lord now. And some of these guys will be with him later on. But I'm going to share with you three tonight, three tonight and uh, in, a, in a couple more tomorrow. And we'll get there. But here's, here's what some of these theologians have said. So Jonathan Edwards, uh, he's, a, he's a pastor from a, a way back. And uh, he wrote this. He said, prayer is as natural of an expression of faith as breathing is to life. Prayer is... Is a natural as an is, a, is as a natural as an expression of faith as breathing is to life. So as important it is to breathe to be alive, he's saying that an example of faith is a life of prayer, being a person of prayer. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm unsure who said this, or who, I was at a conference and I wrote this down when this person said it. I, I can't remember who it was, but this is what they said. It said, "On that day, where by God's grace I stand in His presence, two realities will be undeniable to me." One, the indescribable glory of God is indeed eternally satisfying. And two, how deeply I underused the privilege of prayer. Like they, he's, what this person was saying is like, man, when I see God in all of his glory and how beautiful that's going to be, I'm going to realize that I had access to that God this time on earth through the, through the avenue of prayer. And I underused that privilege. Man, that was powerful to me. Uh, and then the last one is Charles Spurgeon. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, he once said, Prayer and praise are the oars by which a man may row his boat into the deep waters of the knowledge of Christ. Prayer and praise are the oars that a person will row their boat into the deep waters of God. Now, what I, what I love about that, he didn't say Bible college, theology degrees, pastors, deacons, you know, service. He says prayer Time spent in prayer and time spent in praise are the oars by which you row into the deep waters of the knowledge of Christ. It's beautiful, beautiful stuff to hear there. So let me, let me pray. Let's pause for a moment. Let me pray for us real quick again, and let's dive into what the Lord has for us tonight in John 17. All right, Lord, I love you, and God, I'm grateful for this weekend. I'm grateful for the resources, uh, human resources, financial resources, God, just to, to be able to put on a weekend like this where we just kind of dedicate this time to you. Uh, and Lord, so I pray that this will be a fruitful weekend for each person involved at Union Hill this week. God, that you would use our time wisely. We would use our time. Uh, we would we'd give you our time. We, we would give you our hearts. We'll give you our minds, God, uh, this weekend to, to hear from you and to be uh, challenged by you. And Lord, may we respond to you. God, tonight, give us the ears to hear. Give us the minds to understand. And Father, give us the faith to walk in obedience to your word. We love you. It's your beautiful name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, John 17. We're going to look at the first, first, first five verses. Now, let me, let me go ahead and just do a disclaimer because I'm, it's going to drive me nuts the whole time I'm speaking up here tonight. I'm recovering from a cold that I got earlier this week. So if I'm a little congested or whatever, like that's, that's why I'm trying to fight, like not like blowing my nose and this sort of thing. So, so I'm trying to fight that. So if I get a little tongue-tied, just bear with me. I, I apologize up front. But I came down with a cold Sunday, and it's kicked my butt since Wednesday, and I'm just now getting over it. So I apologize if I sound a little weird or I get a little bit where I don't, you can't understand me. So I'm going to try to go slower and speak a little more clear in this. But John 17, verses 1 through 5, let's read this for just a second. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to, to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. All right, in John 16... We listen in as Jesus comforts his disciples uh, by sharing with them that there is coming some pain and there is coming some sorrow in their life. He's, he's telling them, like, hey, things are about to get really, really bad. Things, the world is about to start pressing in on you, and it's going to become very challenging. And he reminds them that as suffocating, as overbearing as the world may soon seem to be, that he has overcome the world. 
All right, so tonight I want you to hear this for me. Jesus has overcome the world. Don't, don't, do not dismiss that important fact, right? I don't know. Some of you may have, have faced some serious pain, some serious sorrow in your lives already. Some of you may have not, but li listen, it's coming. And I don't mean that to be the bearer of bad news. I just, I just mean to say that that's, we live in a broken world, right? And, and so things aren't the way that they are supposed to be. And so, so when that conflicts with our faith, it's going gonna, it's gonna to press in. It's going to be hard, right? So let's, let's not dismiss these words that Jesus says to his disciples. I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. That, that is a very beautiful saying right there that should comfort all of us. But Jesus doesn't just rely on his words to comfort his, friend, his, comfort his friends. We see him shift into a posture of prayer. So immediately from John 16 to John 17, we go into this, this posture of prayer. That's what it means in, in 17.1 where it says Jesus had spoken these words. He's spoken these words of comfort to his friends, and now he's positioning into this posture of prayer where he begins to pray. And he goes on to give his friends some, so he goes on and he takes time to pray for them and we see Jesus leaning into God the Father for his friends security for their joy for their unity and for their future and in John 17 we listen as Jesus prays for himself as he prays for his friends and as he prays for all those who will listen to their testimony and respond by grace through faith I mean, so that, that's kind of the outline of John 17. We're going to be walking through that this weekend. So this weekend, we're going to look at Jesus' prayer in these three parts with the hope that we can or that we will pattern or we will model our prayer life after uh, in, this, in a similar fashion. And so tonight, we're going to look at how Jesus takes the time to pray for himself. All right, we're going to look, in, look at tonight and see how Jesus takes time to pray for himself and how we should be doing the same. And so... Uh, before, I think before we could do that, we have to understand what we know about Jesus, okay? We have to, we have to get an understanding of what we know or what we come to know about Jesus, and, and that is that while he was fully God, he also was fully human. And I think sometimes we, we tend to forget the fully human side of the Lord, right? Because he's, he's God, right? We see, we read all these miracles that he did, we, we, all these great things that he did, and we're like, we can never do that. But he was also fully human. He was fully divine, but he was also limited by a human body, all right? And so, so let's, there's some things that we know about God being fully human, right? He was born. He was born to a woman, right? The scriptures tell us Mary gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swallowing clothes and laid him in the manger because there was no place for them in the end. Luke chapter 2. Uh, Jesus experienced ordinary human growth and development like you and I. Like at one point in time, you were an infant. You moved to a toddler. You moved to a elementary school kid now you're a middle school or high school right like you, you you're bigger you're stronger you're smarter hopefully like you you're you're growing up you're developing right you don't look the same as you did when you know 10 years ago right so you're different right so jesus same thing he he hurt ordinary growth in human development we read that when joseph and mary and jesus returned to nazareth it says jesus grew and he became strong and he was filled with wisdom and the favor of god was upon him uh, Jesus would get hungry. Matthew 4 tells us that after he fasted for 40 days that he was hungry. Jesus would thirst, John 19, 28. In John 4, we, we see Jesus gets fatigued and he gets tired. In Matthew 8, we read that Jesus is resting and he's sleeping. In John 11, we read that Jesus wept. In Luke 4, Jesus faced temptation from the devil as you and I are tempted. Hebrews 2, 18 tells us that Jesus suffered. And in John 19, we read that he died and that he was buried. So, so, he displayed emotions just like you and I. He went through the full range of life just like you and I will. He's, he's experienced the, the growth and the pains of life just like you and I have. So, so Jesus can relate to us. And I want that's really important, I think, for us to realize as followers of God is that we have a Savior who identifies with us because he was one of us. Right, and so he knows you, and when when we talk about he knows you, like he knows you very well because he's he's experienced life as you are. All right, and so so when Jesus is is praying for himself here to glorify the Father, it's because he is aware of the sufferings that lay ahead. Right, he he's the betrayal, the severe beatings, the mockery, the shame, the embarrassment of all that was to come in the hours ahead. Jesus is aware of all this. And ultimately, Jesus is praying that the Lord exhausts his life for the advancement of his kingdom here on earth. Use up the very last bit of my life for your glory. 
And so when I, when I, when I say that, it's a phrase I often say to my, my students and when I, when I teach a lot, it's like, God, let's, let's be people who pray that God exhausts our life. And what I like, the example I like to use is just imagine like a sponge. Soak it in water and then wring that thing out. Like, I wring my life out for you. So there's nothing there. Like, I'm offering you my entire life for you to do as you see fit, wring it out. All right. And so, and then John 15, and that's what, and, and look, and that's what we see happening here, right? In the, in the, in the preceding chapters of John, right? We see Jesus betrayed. We see Jesus beaten. We see Jesus mocked. We see Jesus, you know, in, in, in some, some terrible, terrible situations where his life is being wrung out for the glory of God, right? For the salvation of the world, like completely used up. And so, Following that example would be a posture of prayer saying, God, exhaust my life for your fame and your glory, right? And so John 15, 16, Jesus is sharing with the disciples that there's coming a time when being associated with him is going to be really hard. He says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. So that's important. Like I, I'm saying these things to you not to scare you, not just to warn you, but to keep you from falling away away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is going to come when whoever kills you will think he's offering service to God. And if, if, you're, if you're familiar with the scriptures at all, we, we get to Acts and we, we're introduced to a guy named Saul, right? And Saul is, is there and he's holding the coats of, of, of the people who are beating a young man named Stephen and, until he's dead. And he's like, I approve of this. Like, this is good. Like, this is what should happen to anybody that says they follow Jesus. And so much so that we read in the next chapter that he begins, what the scriptures say, ravaging the church. And he's going into house to house of anybody he believes is a Christian. He's putting, their, he's putting them in jail and prison. And these people leave Jerusalem because they are scared of the persecution that is now coming at the hands of this guy named Saul, who we would later know as Paul, that God changed his heart. Let me rephrase that. God didn't change his heart. God gave him a new heart. The scripture tells us that he, he replaces the heart of stone with the heart of flesh, and he puts a new spirit within our bodies, right? And so God did that, and he made Paul, or he said, this is my chosen instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles, to everybody, the non-Jews. Like, he's going to be my chosen instrument. He will suffer for my name. And, and so we have most of our New Testament was written by Paul and most of the we read about the Acts where Paul is going on these journeys and he's planning these churches and he's writing these letters back to these churches to strengthen them. So so Paul became a, a, a huge instrument in the life of the believer, right? And so we see this happening. But when when Paul was Saul, when we knew him as Saul, like that's what he thought he was doing, right? And it's what Jesus says here, like they will kick you out of the synagogues, they they are going to kill you thinking he is offering service to the Lord. And that was that was Saul. I mean, that was kind of the idea there with Saul. So and uh, so anyway, so going on, Peter, there's a, there's a apostle named Peter, right? And Peter reminds his friends, and in 1 Peter, he writes this letter, and he reminds his friends in his first letter of this. He says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering are, be, is, are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the entire world. Now, who Paul, who, excuse me, who Peter is writing to here, it, it gives us in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, it tells us, it says these are, these, this letter is written to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. All right, that dispersion he's talking about is when Stephen was stoned and Saul was saying that should happen to everybody else and everybody fled Jerusalem. That's, that's the dispersion. That was, that's the dispersion he's talking about. And he, so he's writing to the people who left Jerusalem and they went to these other areas of the world. He's writing them a letter. He's saying like, hey, you guys left Jerusalem, you fled Jerusalem, and you're preaching the gospel where you are. And he's like, this is a letter to encourage you. Like, hey, don't forget, like the devil is, is, is prowling around like a lion. And like, you're not the only ones who's facing suffering. Your brother all throughout the other regions are facing it as well. And so there are going to be moments. I share that with you because there are going to be moments in your walk with the Lord when you're going to come under fire for your faith. There's going to come moments where you're going to come under fire for your faith. And these moments might not come at the hands of other people. It may be circumstances that you unexpectedly find yourself in that begin to press in and challenge your faith. It may not just be people. It might be circumstances. Man, life just might get really, really hard. Um, you know, what I tell people often, or I try to remind people often, is that there's everybody in this room I'm going to go on a limb and says has a cell phone, all right? 
And, and every single one of you right now, you're a phone call away from your life being changed. I mean, that's it. I mean, you're one phone call away. Hey, come home. Something's happened to mom or dad. Or mom and dad get a phone call that says, hey, I need you to come to the office. The, the news from the test results are not good. I mean, just one phone call can completely start to press in and challenge your faith. So none of us are exempt from that from happening to us. All right, so we need to be aware of that. So if that can happen to all of us, the natural question I'm going to ask you is this. How are you preparing yourself for those moments? How are you preparing yourself for those moments? Um, how? How are you? Are you is your response, well, I come to church. Um, I listen to Christian music occasionally. Uh, you know, what, what is it? What is the thing? You know, like, hey, I've got a JR in my life. Well, that's great. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm very, and I don't mean that sarcastically. I, I mean that for real. Like, I, that's really great. But listen, listen to me. JR's not going to be around forever. He's not. Um, Brian's not going to be around forever. Your pastor here, you know, is, is not going to be around forever. Like, we have lifespans. You know, and, and the Lord will move. And, the Lord, and so your relationship with the Lord is what is super important. And so how are you, Christian, follower of God, son, daughter of God, how are you preparing yourself for the moments when life gets really, really, really hard and your faith gets really, really challenged? Are you praying that the Lord exhaust your life for the advancement of his kingdom on earth. Are you praying like God, you know, we have, we have these examples in scripture. Uh, you know, I, I, there was several, when I was, I was wrestling with this, I really know where to go with this and, and how to, what to handle, what to hand you this weekend. But one of the things that kept coming to my mind as I was thinking about let us pray and, and all, you know, offering our lives to the Lord was Isaiah chapter six, where Isaiah sees the Lord face to face, and, and the and the Lord the Lord the angel comes and atones for his sin by placing a hot coal in his mouth, and he says, well, "Who's going to go for us?" And, and Isaiah's response is, "I will. Here I am. Send me." You know, and, and and so that should be us. So that that should be our response, right? But but so we should be praying. You know, this God use my life, exhaust my life for the advancement of your kingdom here on earth. But that's not where we're going to go tonight uh, in that. But so uh, but how do we do that? How do we get to the point, or how do we, you know, if we're, if we're there, we're like, hey, God, I want you to exhaust my life for your glory. But how? Like, how, how, is, how does that happen? Like, it's one thing to say it. It's one thing to say, hey, do that, and go, all right, break, let's pray, go to your host homes and have a great time. And, like, I don't really know. Like, I know I should, but what's the roadmap? Or, like, how, what's the process? Like, you said you are going to point me in a direction and say follow, but all you did was just say do this, and I don't really know what to do. So, so that's what we that's what we're going to kind of look at. It's, it's one thing to say, hey, pray this way, but it's another thing to be shown how to effectively exhaust yourself to be used by God for the advancement of his name. And I believe that our brother Paul gives us some advice and some encouragement and some direction. So Romans 12. Go to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. It may be a familiar verse to you, uh, but we're going to spend some time there tonight. Romans 12, 1 and 2. This is what Paul writes to his friends in Rome. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. All right, so, so how do we exhaust ourselves? How do we exhaust our lives? How do, we, how do we get to the point or how do, we, how do we put ourselves in that posture where we exhaust ourselves for the glory of God and for his kingdom here on earth? And the first thing we do is that we submit our bodies to the Lord. We, we surrender our bodies to the Lord. Before you trusted Christ, before you placed your faith in Christ, we used our bodies for sinful pleasures and purposes. As Paul reminds the Ephesians in chapter 2 when he writes this, he says, And you were dead in the trespasses of sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But now that we belong to him, 
We want to use our body for his glory. Paul would go on to explain, he says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with, with which he loved us, he made us alive together with Christ. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we yield our bodies to Jesus so that he will continue God's work through us. So we yield our bodies to him. We surrender our bodies to him. But we've been, but we've been brought from death to life, right? So if you've been baptized, that, that, that the pastor probably said that when you were, you know, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, right? So you've, been, so you've been buried with him in baptism, you raised to walk in newness of life. So this idea of being a sacrifice, you know, sacrifice kind of implies death. Like, you know, you're going to be this sacrifice and your life is going to be over, but we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. So we offer God our living bodies. We say, God, while I'm here, use me. Exhaust my life for your kingdom. Take my body and use it. Take this cracked vessel and use it however you see fit to make your kingdom advance on this planet. Use me however you see. So we're not to physically die again as being a sacrifice implies, yet we offer ourselves as these living sacrifices, and that's what makes this unique. We die to ourselves, but we live for Christ. We now do the work that God has prepared for us to do to build his kingdom, not ours. So we yield our lives, we yield our bodies so that God will build his kingdom and not ours. Now, the world's going to tell you to do something different, right? The, the world's going to tell you, like, to do the American dream, right? Go to college, get a good degree so you can get a good job, so you can buy a nice house, you can get nice cars, you can go on nice vacations. Like, and you can build a name for yourself, right? Which, none of that's bad, like that's none of that's bad, but if that is the goal of your life is to advance your name, like man, you you are investing in treasures that are going to rot, spoil, and fade, and can be destroyed by fire. Like, and I have a, a pastor that I really enjoy read, reading his books and listening to him, and what he says is that all that stuff that we accumulate is just future stuff that your your children are going to sell in garage sales. Like that's all it is. It's just yard sale material, right? And so so if that's what you want to, you know, that it's all it's going no matter how great you think it is, like it's where it's going to end up, right? So. Nonetheless, so we, so we now do the work that God's prepared us to do to build, to build his kingdom, not ours. And we do this, three, we do this by, so how do we offer our lives? How do, we, how do we surrender our bodies to him? We do this three ways. Sacrificially giving of ourselves and of our resources. We sacrificially give of our time. We sacrificially give of our resources. Um, God has blessed us with, uh, with these things. And we are stewards of the gifts God gives us, meaning God has uniquely equipped and gifted each one of you with talents and resources that we leverage for the advancement of the gospel. Like, I never met Grace before. She's got a beautiful voice. She's very talented in what she does. Um, she could use those talents and those gifts to, to try to further her own name in, in a music industry or career, I'm sure, or whatever. And, and I've got friends of mine that, that are just as talented and, and have, you know, could probably do the same thing and make money that and, and make a life that way. But their desires, like, man, even though they may pursue that, they offer that gift to the church. Like, they continue to invest in the church by using that gift that God's given them. So there's nothing wrong with those things. Like, you steward it well, right? Just, just, Give it back to the Lord. Like, God, you gave me this talent and gift. I'm going to give you a portion of it back and use it, right? So we see that happening. One Bible, one Bible commentator has written this. He says, if you like baseball or dancing or reading, it probably has a missional purpose and is not just intended for your own entertainment and enjoyment. So, for example, if you're a follower of Jesus and you're on your school's football team, baseball team, softball team, basketball team, volleyball team, cheerleading squad. Whoever made cheerleading tonight, congratulations. Majorette, congratulations to you as well. My daughter's a cheerleader. I know the stress of waiting for that to be released. So when your mom came in and was like, I can breathe now, I totally relate to that whole thing, all right? Or if you're in the band or you're involved in any other small group of peers that you gather together over a common interest or skill, listen to me. God has shrunk down the population of your school. He has shrunk down the population of your school He's uniquely, uniquely equipped you and he's uniquely placed you and given you favor with that group of peers for the sole purpose of making him known. So offer, surrender your body and your talents and your resources and leverage that for the advancement of the kingdom. So that's, that's the first way that we surrender and offer our bodies to him. The other part of it is we live a life of holiness. 
We live a life of holiness. Our lives are marked. This, what this means is what, what this living a life of holiness means. Let me explain what living a life of holiness means. Well, living a life of holiness means is not being good. All right, it's not changing your behavior. Like being a Christian is not a behavior modification program that you, you know, that you just behave now. Like you just follow the rules and, and it's of society and because you're a good person, that means you're somehow love a Jesus, like you somehow love Jesus, right? No, living a life of holiness is that your life is now marked by distinctively different values than the world. Your life is marked by distinctively different values. This is exactly what Jesus was referring to in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus tells his people or his disciples this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. He says, blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. This is the result of that. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You're like a city that is set on a hill. Let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and praise your Father who is in heaven. Like that's the result, right? That's, those are the distinctively different values that our lives should be marked by, by being followers of Jesus. That what it mean, that's what it means to live a life of holiness, that our lives are marked by distinctively different values. Blessed are the makers of peace, not the creators of chaos and confusion. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, not the, those who hunger and thirst for power and control and money and, and wisdom. Blessed are those who, who are poor in spirit. One Bible commentator says that man, most, of, most people in America think they're middle class in spirit, that, they, that God somehow owes us something because we have something that we can offer him. It says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, that realize that we bring nothing to the table. Everything that we have has been given to us as a gift from God, and we are stewards of it. So we live by distinctively different values. So if you live this way, Jesus says, you'll stand out like salt of the earth, light of the world, city of a hill. So, we, so the second way we do it is that we, we or first way we, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices at, or is that we surrender our talents. We, we give our resources to the Lord. And, and the second one is we live a life of holiness. And the thirdly, we strive to live an acceptable and pleasing life of obedience to the commands of God. Listen to the psalm writer, Psalm 119, as they write this. He says, with my whole heart, I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. We become students of scripture to not only know the commands of God, but to live obediently to the commands of God. I believe we unfortunately seem to be living in a community today that doesn't put too much emphasis on obedience. Um, but the Lord does. You know, we put a lot of, of, of emphasis on participating and being present, but not so much on obedience. Like we can come to church and we can worship and we can attend church and do, you know, serve on this team or whatever, but but our lives are not marked by any type of obedience to the commands of God whatsoever at all. Like we can do what we want to do. We can say what we want to do. We can, we can do with our boyfriends, our girlfriends, whatever we want to do. Just as long as we acknowledge God, we're cool or God's cool with it. And that's not the case. I mean, if we, let me warn you, that's not the case. I mean, we have stories all throughout scripture that warn us differently. Like in, in, for example, in, in 1 Samuel 15, we, sh we should learn from the example of King Saul when he overlooked God's command in destroying the things of the Malachites. And the prophet Samuel revealed God's anger towards Saul by explaining, to the, by explaining that the Lord desires obedience 
over any type of sacrifice. I mean, in this moment, King Saul, he was the king of Israel, and King Saul, he, told, he was told, like, go and fight the Amalekites and destroy the Amalekites, destroy everything of the Amalekites. And he goes and he fights the Amalekites and he wins the battle, but he doesn't destroy everything. He keeps some of the things back and he's going to offer them to the Lord. And, and the Lord's like, that's not what I said do. Like, he's like, but King Saul was like, but I did what you told me to do. Like, I went to war. Like, I did kind of half the command and I was successful at it. And so, but this was a good, I thought this would be good for you. And God's like, I don't need that. I desire obedience. And I think sometimes as we offer to God, it's like this kind of half-hearted obedience. Like, I'll do this, but I don't want to do this. And so we need to understand that. I mean, the Lord desires obedience over your sacrifice. So let's, let's, let's live lives acceptable and pleasing to the Lord as obedience to his commands. So we submit our bodies to the Lord by giving of ourselves sacrificially, living a life of holiness and obedience. So there's three ways we do this. There's three ways that we, we, we ask the Lord to exhaust or we, we model exhausting our lives for the glory of God. And that is, one is that we surrender our bodies to the Lord. The next one is we submit our minds to the Lord. We surrender our minds to the Lord. Now, while we live lives set apart for the purposes of God and holiness, we're going to be encouraged to conform to the patterns of this world. And the patterns of this world are brokenness, rebellion, deception, and questioning the ways of God. But our minds have been renewed. Our minds have been transformed by the grace and the power of God, but we still must fight against being susceptible to distraction. Now, listen, I'm not here to beat you up on your cell phones. I love my cell phone. I love my iPhone. I think it's the greatest thing that's ever been invented. I love my iPad. I love it. Everything's connected. Everything works together. Like, my calendar's all together. I get notifications on these things, so I can't be late, or I can't say I don't know about certain things. Like, I love my devices. I love being connected to people. I love being connected to the world. Like, I love it. Like, I love the fact that I can go and look at and see what it looks like in London right now. Like, I got a friend of mine who's a missionary there, and I'm like, hey, it looks, looks like it's raining there, you know? And he's like, it's always raining over here. Like, I I love being connected to people. So I'm not here to beat you up on your devices. But man, let me tell you right now, I'll be the first one to admit, man, my device is the most distracting thing in my life. Like, I mean, I, I'll find myself at my kids' ball games and I'm like scrolling away and all of a sudden something happens. I'm like, oh, oh, wow, hey, good job, buddy. Like, I, you know, I, or I'll find myself at night when I should be in bed and going to sleep. Like, I'm up for like an hour and a half watching videos of people living in their car on YouTube, you know? And I'm like, that's, you know, I'm like, this is fascinating. A person lives in a Honda Element. That's insane, you know? And I'm like, watch, you know, two hours of them living in their car. And, and I'm like, this, I don't know, it's crazy, right? So I understand, man, uh, being attached to your device. But man, man, I see the, the dangers of it too and the distractions that come with it. And so, and we have to be careful and we have to just be aware that, man, we live in a world that our minds are susceptible to being distraction and we have to fight that, right? And so Paul writes to the believers in Colossae, he says this, says, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not things that, here, that are here on the earth. Listen, your life is wonderfully, inextricably, eternally bound up with Jesus. And heavenly mindedness aligns us with that fact teaching us to define our identity not by the person that we see in the mirror are reflected back to you on your screen, but in the Savior that we see in Scripture. Yet such a mindset does not nullify the life that we have here on the earth, but it rather transforms our life here on earth according to the culture and norms of heaven. If we are hidden with Christ, we cannot help but look more like Christ here and now. And we often find ourselves, we should often find ourselves positioned, repeating the words of our Savior when he instructs the disciples how to pray using the plea, your kingdom, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like, God, what is going on in heaven right now? The praise that is being offered to you and pray, like, God, bring that down here. We want that happen here now. Like, one of my favorite authors is John Piper. He wrote a book called Let the Nations Be Glad. And the, the whole thing starts out this way. It says, missions is a temporary necessity. It says, the, the fuel of missions is worship. Because we're all called, worship is going to be eternal. Missions is temporary. So the whole fuel and goal of, of missions is worship. So we should be praying that all the nations come to know the Lord and worship him for his goodness. And so... So we should be praying what's going on in heaven. Man, 
let that come down here on earth, God. Like, let the people of every nation, tribe, and tongue. I mean, one day it's going to happen, right? I mean, one day every nation, tribe, and tongue is going to, to praise the Lord. Like, but that's what we should be praying now. Like, God, you're, what's going on in heaven, let that happen here on the earth. So let's have a mindset that does that. Heaven, heavenly mindedness is an invitation to be with Jesus as much as we can in preparation for the day when we will be with him always. And what does this mean for our heavenly mindedness? It means that our minds are most full of heaven when they are most full of Christ. Because to set your minds on the things that are above means at its core, set your minds on Jesus. So Lord, set my, use my body as you see fit to accomplish the, 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 the redemptive purpose in the world that Jesus came to do. God, use my mind, set my mind on the things that are above. So use my mind. And the last thing is this, that use my will, submit my will. Submit your will to the Lord. In Luke 22, we read, Jesus withdrew from the disciples. He, he stepped away from the disciples and he knelt down and he prayed and he said, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Listen, guys, one of the hardest, most difficult things you can pray is this. Lord, your will, not mine. There is a way that I want things to work out but I trust you over what my mind can understand. Build your kingdom, not mine. Guys, that's gonna be one of the most hardest, most difficult things you can pray. And, and it's gonna be challenging to get to the point in your life where you actually mean it. I mean, there's been times in my life where we, we went through a period a, a, a few years ago where we were faced with some decisions. We were faced, well, not really decisions. They were just kind of ops. They were just kind of things were happening and we were out of our control. And I remember walking with a, a friend was walking with me through that. And I remember sitting in an office saying, man, I, I'm, 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 I know the answers. Like I, I know if, if I was counseling you in this moment, like I know exactly what I would tell you. Now it's called application. And the application to my life is really, really difficult right now. So what I'm telling you is I'm not saying, hey, this is easy. I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. Like I'm telling you, like as a man who's been walking with the Lord for a few decades, like this is difficult. It's difficult today. It's as difficult today as it was when I was 17 years old. And there's times in my life where I'm going, God, do I really mean this? Like do I really, do I really want your will to trump mine? Do I really, do I really trust you over what I understand? Like, God, do I really, do I really want this? Do I, do I really, I want, I want to mean it. Like, well, I, I really, really want to mean it, but God, I'm scared. Like, I'm really, really scared, All right? So this is one of the most difficult things that you will ever pray. But listen, being willing to actually deny yourself, your wants and your desires is no easy thing. It will be a constant battle. It will take constant abandonment to self. It will take constant faith. But when we give ourselves and our minds in service to the Lord and our will, our will, our will will instinctively follow. When we give our bodies, when we give our minds, our will will instinctively follow. It will look like this. Oh, this is where we want to get to. I will go anywhere. I will do anything. Just lead me. I will go anywhere. I will do anything. Just lead me. I am totally devoted to Jesus and his mission of redemption in this world. And listen, I get it. I think we sometimes have this fear that surrendering our will to the Lord is going to result in a disappointing life. Like God's going to put us somewhere we don't want to be. Like God's going to put us in a position to do something we just don't really want to do. Like we're just not going to enjoy it. Like, you know, like I'm scared of heights. I don't like flying. And so one of the biggest fears of man is like God would turn me into a pilot, you know, or something like I'd fly like a helicopter, you know, and find missionaries from over, you know, like, I don't know. Right. I would hate that. Like, I mean, I just be honest with you. I would hate it. Cause I don't, I don't like flying. I don't, I don't fly. I don't want to fly. Um, and, and I wouldn't want to do that, you know? And so, so yeah, I would think like, you know, part of me is kind of scared. Like God, I just, I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. Just not a pilot. Not something that not requires me to be on a plane. Like, I mean, that would be kind of something in the back of my mind. Right. But listen to me guys. Like, God is not going to set your life on this course or path that you're not going to enjoy. When our lives are totally surrendered to him, he becomes our life. When we're totally surrendering him like he becomes our joy. When we're totally surrendering him like he becomes our treasure. 
God's plan is not about depriving us of good things. He delights to give his children good gifts. Like he takes joy in giving you good gifts. He also desires above all else for us to follow him and delight in him. I mean, God is, he's a good God. And you are his son and you are his daughter that he is redeemed by the blood of his only begotten son, Jesus. But he loves you and he cares about you. And when you come alongside and fall in love with the mission of God, and you offer your body as a living sacrifice to him, you offer your mind to be about the things of God, and you surrender all the hopes and dreams and desires you have for building your own kingdom here on earth, and you're willing to set that aside for the, for the redemption of the world, man, God's going to honor that. And God's going to use you in whatever God calls you to do even if it is flying a helicopter, right? Like, you're going to love it because you're going to be about the things your father is about because he's your joy. He's your life. He's your treasure. And that's what you're doing. And you're honoring your father through your service. And that's a beautiful thing. All right, so this week, so, so tonight, we're wrapping this thing up tonight. So tonight, the, the idea is this, like, man, we start by praying. We follow Jesus' example in John 17 by praying, God, use my life for your glory. Use my life for your glory. Look, and you guys have, you know, I'm not going to pretend. Like, God knows this, your start date. Like, he knows your birthday. He also knows the date you're going to pass away. Like, I, I don't mean to be morbid or anything like that, but Acts is pretty clear that he is determined every single day that it's come to be. He knows how far you'll travel on this earth. He knows the days you'll live on it, right? And so some of you have decades, right? You have decades ahead of you. And you've got a long life ahead of you of serving the Lord. And I hope and I pray that, that this weekend you start praying, like, God, use my life to glorify your name. Use my life at school. Use my life, at, use my life on the cheer team, on the majorette line, on the football team, basketball team, whatever club you're involved in. Like, exhaust my life for your glory on the campus of my school, in my home, amongst my peers, in my church. God, use my life for your glory. Glorify yourself in me. Let's start praying that, guys. Let me challenge you to start praying that tonight. And as you leave here and as we think through these things this weekend, throw that. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Offer him your mind. Offer him your will. And say, God, use my life. Exhaust my life for the advancement of your kingdom here on earth.